Ross and Kitty be invited into places like Tel Aviv. Great software. Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready? Do we want to get into that? You can use DNA. Boy, those robots look cool performing. Cool, so um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Aran, and uh, I'm going to give a talk today about boom performance. Before we begin, a little bit about myself. I've um, been writing code ever since I remember myself, basically, since the age of uh, nine, nine or ten, and um, I've been loving the web ever since, and also, you know, a big fan of mobile. Uh, before um, starting the polls, I was uh, R&D manager and was a part of the founding team in uh, Como, which you guys also might know as uh, Conduit Mobile. And today I'm co-founder and CDO at the polls. And uh, this is my email. If you want to have a chat or just looking for your next challenge, uh, we're hiring developers, so feel free to contact me. So what is Boom Performance? So when we talk about performance on the web, uh, we got a couple of types of performance. One is fast, one is super fast, one is super duper fast, and the one we like at the Pulse is boom performance. And um, basically, you know, it's, it's a term that we invented in-house, but it's something that we talk about all the time. Um, you know, when we develop a new feature or we're working on, you know, something that we do inside the system, we always say, make it boom, make it boom performance. And basically, boom is the time it takes you to say boom. So that's like really fast. And if we put that into numbers, when you are inside a web application and the user has to wait for something to happen, there's actually the, there's a research done on that topic that you know, divides the time you need to wait into several categories. So if a user needs to wait 10 seconds, you know, that's not out of the blue. It happens sometimes. It feels like that, by the way. I know you guys. Uh, uh, don't experience that much, but this is how 10 seconds feel. So what happens is that the user feels like something is not working. You know, the internet is not working, the website is not working, something that I'm working, and that's a big turn off. If it needs to wait one second, yeah, only one second, this is how it feels like, more or less. What happens is that this person have a context switch. You know, he started thinking about his life, his family, you know, his little kid waiting for him at home. So, and he started thinks about other stuff. When a user waits for 300 to one second, 300 millisecond, it feels like something is happening, machine is working, you know, it's waiting for the website, something is going on. And 100 to 300, you know, it's a small delay, but it's still perceived as a delay for the user. And w whenever you do something on the web that happens between zero and 100 millisecond, that's instant. That's an instant feeling that something happened right now. And this is the boom I'm talking about, and this is what I'm going to focus on on my lecture. So why focus on performance? Why boom is important? First of all, it affects your product, and it affects your product more than you think. Um, you don't know how it affects your product. I really love you know, people, developers looking in, you, you guys use all kinds of uh, performance tools like New Relic and all kinds of stuff. The graphs look solid, everything looks fine. But at the end of the day, you know, people are complaining. People are experiencing, you know, slow performance. And people, you know, get negative about your product and about what you do when they experience slow performance. When you get boost speed, people use your product more. So if it's fast, and I give, you know, Google as an example. Google is really fast. Everyone perceives Google as a very fast tool. So I search something on Google, I get result, you know, instantly, uh, 0 0.24 seconds. But because Google is so fast, I mean, I personally even use it as a spell checker because I don't mind typing, you know, I'll do like a word into Google and get results instantly. And that's even faster than opening, you know, a, a dedicated app on my laptop. And I even use it, you know, to calculate um, a small, you know, uh, calculation with numbers also. And, you know, I got the calculator app on my Mac, but I still prefer to use Google because it's so fast. So that's, you know, you get more usage because your app is super fast. Also, when you have a fast UI, uh, your app will be less cluttered. And how many times have you heard 
you know, users asking for features like, oh, can you move this and that button to the main page? I want to do this action. Instead of going to that page, put it on the main screen. You know why they're asking for it? It's not because they want, you know, a cluttered UI with a lot of functions and buttons. It's because it takes time to get from one page to another page. So they prefer to do it on the main page. So when your user interface is slow, people will ask you to move stuff around and it will make your product much worse, much more cluttered and much worse. I think that, you know, for me and for our users and, and the way user perceive products is that when you get the boom effect, when something is happening really fast, your product is really addictive. When it's fast enough, if it solves a problem for the user, it's going to use it. But if it's not fast enough and if, if it's doing something for, um, you know, for what I need to do for my job or anything, it's going to be painful. And you guys know what I'm talking about. You, you're using tools like, you know, Salesforce, which is an amazing tool, but everyone perceives it as slow. And you guys are using Jira, which is an amazing tool, but everyone perceives it as slow. So people suffer, you know, they, they curse the tool and I think it's shit only because it's slow. And I think, you know, my take from this, and, and, and there's something very important in that, you know, whenever you create a feature, that's cool. But the best thing you can do in order to improve your product right now, tomorrow, is to improve the performance. A new feature, a new killer feature, is going to affect 10, 10 or 20% of your users. But if you improve the performance overall of your application, it's going to affect everyone. And it's going to increase uh, the overall happiness of the, of the user. So another thing people ask me is, why, why me? I mean, I'm just a developer. Why I need to be concerned about you know, the product and the performance and everything? Because you know, the product guy or the design guy or girl, um, you know, they don't know if something can be done faster. You guys control the code. You guys control the server client communication. And you guys know where and what can be optimized in your tool. So you need to ask yourself, you know, how can I make this faster and help the product and design guys make decisions. So this is why you need Boom and this is what Boom Performance is. Let's talk about how to achieve Boom Performance. So I'll start with the basics which you guys probably more or less know. So you can minify JavaScript and CSS. I'll go through this quickly because I assume most of you know what I'm talking about. Use GZIP compression, optimize images, use a CDN, prioritize visible content like CSS and JavaScript in order to make the page loads faster, and remove all kind of random blocking JavaScript and uh, CSS from rendering your HTML page. So that's the basic. I mean, I don't want to go into that. Uh, I'm sure most of you guys know that or you can find information online. I think one of the points I want to clarify is that, you know, and I've seen so many times in the past, you know, as a developer and as a team leader, how easy it is to shoot yourself in the foot. We all use, you know, tons of libraries, either on the server side or the client side, and we write a lot of, you know, this cool little pieces of a code that we use in that library, and we don't know what happens behind the scenes. So let's just have a look at this, you know, simple JavaScript code that does a simple loop, and for every iteration of the loop, it makes a small Java, uh, jQuery uh, search on the DOM. So it's like you see the dollar sign and it search for uh, uh, a class inside the HTML page. So it's very simplistic, it seems very harmful. But what happens behind the scenes is that jQuery travels through the DOM and searches for every iteration of that loop, searches again and again and again for that specific element. So this little harmful line of code is performing a lot of operations inside your HTML code. So a simple way to avoid that is either put that outside because you don't need to do redo that calculation for every iteration. Well, what happened? Boom. Yes? Okay. Yeah, we're back. <coughs> okay. So, instead of doing that, uh, how many people, you know, you saw doing that kind of uh, um, code? A again, for every line of code, you search for that specific item again and again and again. Uh, so, you can either, you know, put um, multiple changes to that item on the same line, or you can cache that specific selector and op make all kinds of operation on that item. And my point is not you know, how to optimize jQuery, because you might know that. But 
You might be using React and you might be using Backbone or Angular, or you might be using all kinds of frameworks on the server. And I think one of the key lessons here and, and something that you know, I keep seeing over and over again is that it's very important to know what happens behind the scenes, understand what happens when you make this little line of code, uh, so understand what's happening you know, um, back in that framework. So also what's important is that you make the DOM appear faster. So it's not about the loading time and how long it takes to render the page, but it's also the performance of when you scroll the page. Um, we all know that when you go to a website and you try to scroll and it's very like leggy, it feels like a, a very heavy website. So a lot of stuff that affect the performance of the page itself is all kinds of fancy CSS selectors like round corners, shadow, so on. Be, be aware of you know, connecting all kinds of like scroll callbacks. Uh, people love doing that. It really slows down performance. And uh, avoid using too many elements. Um, always happens when you start coding, you make a div, then you wrap it inside another div and another div and another div, and then you use it as a template and multiply that by 100, and you got a huge DOM element inside your page. That really slows down performance because the browser needs to manage all these elements. Try to use as little as possible. And also, uh, there's all kinds of tricks in HTML. One is use GPU rendering. All modern browsers, I think even Internet Explorer, uh, is, 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 is enabling GPU rendering. Uh, you can trick the browser to think that uh, you need to render something in 3D. Automatically, it transforms that into the GPU. Um, so in this case, just use translate 3D 000, which doesn't change the UI, but forces the browser to move that to the GPU. Uh, one example of that is I've made an experiment just rendering you know, these blue dots. Same piece of code, same CSS. On the left-hand side, you can see the same CSS. The only difference is here. Maybe I'm blocking that. But I have it, this little line, WebKit transform, and that basically moves all these images into the GPU, and the rendering performance is much better. So it might not be relevant to all cases, but this is like one trick in order to increase the performance um, on the user interface. So you know, we talked a little bit about the basics of uh, optimizing HTML pages and JavaScript and CSS and optimizing um, you know, the actual UI of when you scroll the page and when you feed the page. But what I really want to focus on my lecture is more about the product, connecting the product with the, with the code and in order to achieve performance. One topic I want to discuss is optimistic actions. So what is optimistic actions? Let's take one example, an app you probably all know and love, Instagram. So what happens when you try to take a new photo on Instagram? So you take a new photo, um, you know, whatever you want to shoot, and then once you pick the photo, you go into a screen when you need to write whatever you want, if you want to share it on Facebook, other social networks, um, you know, you pick your uh, cute little line that you want to upload into Instagram, and, uh, and so on, and then eventually the photo is being uploaded to Instagram. Straightforward, right? Nothing fancy. But I think, you know, one of the key uh, things that contributed to Instagram's success, you know, remember it's on mobile, is the performance that everything happened. And I think, you know, what they've done is really clever. If you would look at that flow, what I would do as a developer, you know, is, is get all the information, the photo, the information I want to upload, and the description text and upload that into the server, which is about at this, at this point. I got all the information and then I start uploading. What Instagram did, which was very clever, is that right after you took the photo, they automatically started uploading that into the server. And basically what happened was that in some cases, people just uploaded the images to the server and didn't go through the process and they had a little bit of junk. But for the majority of their users, um, you know, they fill out this form, they pick that description they want to use, and boom, they saw it immediately in their feed because in the background, Instagram already uploaded that photo into the server. Imagine the, the feeling that you're using a mobile device, you're not on Wi-Fi, you're on 3G, and, and everything happens instantly. You don't know what happened behind the scenes, but it just happened instantly, like magic. A company that really took the whole concept of optimistic actions to extreme is Facebook. I'm sure you guys are using Facebook all the time and it feels really fast and you're probably thinking, oh, they got these 
huge data centers and, and amazing servers and tons of engineers working on performance. To be honest, it's much more simple than that. When you use Facebook, and I got this little video, that's me using Facebook. And what you see at the bottom is the actual uh, uh, server request. So you, what you see here is that everything you do in the client happens instantly. And on the background, they're actually uh, updating the server. So I've done a little experiment, so it's a little immediately, of turning off the internet and trying to use Facebook. So what happens is that now with no internet, I click on like, it changes and changes back because it failed to make the request. Or if I try to write something, it appears instantly inside the newsfeed and then it asks you to do a retry or say that it didn't work, you know, uh, it didn't put the video, the um, comment into Facebook. So what Facebook did basically, if I look, you know, if I t take a little bit piece of code, is that we all know how to make you know, a server request. What we usually do is we make a request. Upon success, we update the user interface. If there was a failure, sometimes we show an, an alert or something like that. So they took the whole success section and put it on top. So whatever you do, immediately you get a positive feedback from the user interface. And then we handle the server sync. So get immediate effect and then update the server. And even if you had a problem, instead of you know, waiting for the server to give you a reply, you just present it into inside the UI, no fancy alerts or anything, just present it into, into the UI and let the user decide if you want to retry or not. And another example is that we implement this technique is on our sign-up form. So we had a sign-up form and we wanted to increase the conversion of the people that finished the sign-up form. So it's a very simple sign-up form. On the first step, you just need to type your company name. Last step, you need to fill in your name and password, nothing fancy. But we had a problem where on the middle section, you had to pick a subdomain for your account. Now, obviously, it needs to be available. So we had to check with our servers if it's available or not. We wanted everything to be on the client super fast. You click on next, it gets you to the next step, and so on. So what we've done on the second step in order to increase the performance is while the user is typing uh, the subdomain for every letter uh, it types, we go to the server without him knowing we're doing that on the background and check if that subdomain is available or not. And then what happened most of the time, between the time the user typed the subdomain and click on next, we already got the result. So if it was positive, we just let him move on to the next step. He didn't know anything happened behind the scenes. If it was already occupied, with immediately when he clicked on next, we'll show him a message saying it's already taken and you need to pick another one. So that's, you know, one step we've done in order to increase performance, increase the conversion of that form by six or seven percent. So I think, you know, to sum that specific part of the lecture about um, pessimistic, uh, optimistic actions is that you need to think positive. Don't think about you know, what will happen if the server will return an error or anything like that. Think positive. Show the user a positive action and, and assume it worked and render um, the, the positive action inside the user interface. And most of the time, it's not going to fail. And if it does fail, you don't need to have like a fancy error message or anything like that. Just you know, inside the UI, let him retry it or just revert back to the state uh, was. Another topic I want to talk about is action prediction. So that's the whole art of prefetching and preloading and predicting what the user will do. Uh, one thing that we've d been doing on the polls, which is very simple, and you can implement that tomorrow in order to increase the performance, is to preload uh, JavaScript and CSS. So imagine that scenario. People go to your homepage, they sign up, put their emails. Between putting their emails and now they need to confirm their email. So this whole process, you know, no matter how fast your email server is, no matter how fast the user is, it's going to take four or five seconds. You need to go to his uh, email client, confirm the email, and go back to the system. By adding one line of code to your header, you can use prefetch, pre-render, or pre-connect. Basically, what it tells the browser is that once you finish loading that page, when you don't need to load anything else, go and load that resource so it will be available in the browser cache. So what you can do on that specific step is to preload the JavaScript and the CSS for your system. And once it confirms the email, boom, it's inside the system. No need to load any assets, 
No need to load any um, CSS or JavaScript or images. Everything is already prefetched. It's an amazing experience. You got a new user and it fills your, your system. It's state of the art, super fast, super easy to implement. Always remember that your users are predictable. Most of the time, users will do the same action again and again. One example is how to track you if your user is there search for something. So from what we found is that whenever user search something, it's going to search for the same thing again and again, like 80, 70 percent of the times. So you track what he's searching, you preload that into the client, and when you search for it for the next time, you're going to show the results immediately. One tool that achieves that is Type Ahead, is a tool that Twitter developed, and we're actually using that in the polls. So just look at that video, I'll show you what happened behind the scenes. So Twitter is basically know who I usually mention uh, on Twitter, right? So they preload that in the client. Once I start mentioning someone, um, they're using this tool they developed called Type Ahead. So let's wait for the video. So I type O. I get two results immediately, and then the rest of the results are from the server. So what happened is they combine local client results and server results. They preload um, you know, a list of people that they know that I usually mention, like 80, 90% of the time. And then just for the slight case where I actually want to find someone else from the server, they also return server results. So that's an amazing way um, to achieve performance. Other tools like that is Luna, which is like Elasticsearch and Solar on the client, so you can index stuff on the client and do search. And local storage is a great way in order to save stuff into the client. And a wise man once said that no matter how fast your server is, the fastest request is no request at all. Always remember that if you can avoid going to the server round and back, that's the faster way. Uh, the last topic I want to cover is perceived performance. Look at these two examples. These two, two examples operate in the same time exactly. Only that on the left side, it feels like you're waiting for something. Why? Because we show a loading indicator. On the right side, it seems like there's a small animation going on and then the content appears instantly. And both actions take exactly the same time, only that this one is perceived to be faster. Facebook is doing that, and you don't even feel that. They just released this um, about a year ago, I think, this feature where you log into Facebook, they load nothing, and then they show these preloaders, and it feels like um, the content is already there, just missing some images. And we actually made a video of how it felt on Facebook to have a loading indicator versus um, showing a, like a, a, a content inside the page. And you feel that the left side is much faster because you start to see content, you start to see something that's familiar to you, and it feels like Facebook. So we actually done that in the polls as well. Uh, one of our developers, uh, Tal, uh, you know, we chatted about this, and over the weekend, uh, he done the same thing. So this is uh, a video of uh, boards. This is how it used to be. And after we've done the lecture, what he's done is create preloaders, as you can see on the right-hand side, that actually show the content before it's displayed. And we got amazing feedback from our clients. People said, like, wow, you really improved the performance of the system over the weekend. It's much faster now. And we were like, no, we didn't do anything. We're just, you know, showing you. But people, you know, once they see something familiar, they feel like they're there. It's not a, the, the waiting. It's the fact that they see something different and they know they need to wait at this stage. So it's something very simple you can do in order to improve performance. So there's a lot of more that can be covered here, but you know, it's gradual UI loading, use progress bars, buttons, uh, give feedback through buttons, uh, use all kinds of animations, uh, and so on. And I know I got two minutes, so I'll just go over quickly the case study that we had on the polls, uh, something interesting that I want to share. So this is how our system looks like. And uh, this is a feature that's called boards. It's, it's uh, one of the key features inside the system. And this is how we imagine people to use the system uh, when we launched it. And I think like a month after we launched it, people started complaining there's some performance issues and so on. So we asked for screenshots and get data in order to understand why they experience all kind of performance issues. And we saw people creating huge boards, um, you know, with ten, like 20, 30 columns and huge list of, of what we call pulses, these lines. 
and we didn't know how to deal with it because you know we try to optimize all kinds of stuff. So what we've done quickly is uh, instead of rendering um, the board you know on the server, we render it uh, blank and then get to the server. That's pretty basic. Uh, we try to use pagination uh, instead of rendering the entire board. Uh, we tried to move that into the GPU. It wasn't a good decision because it really was, you know, CPU intensive. Uh, we tried to reduce HTML elements. That actually really helped um, to our surprise. So instead of, you know, having all these elements, just reduce the elements. And we tried to use gradual rendering. And, and the last point was the tiebreaker and really what improved the performance. So what, what does it mean? I want to show you a, a video using Firefox 3D view. So that's the board. And if you see the DOM elements inside the board, you can see that for each one of these colorful boxes, there's only one or two elements right now. It's very simple, but it's a very complex element because you can click on it, uh, you can interact with it, and so on. So once I move the mouse on it, you can do all kinds of stuff with that box. So what we've done is that we rendered a very simple uh, HTML element on start. And once you start interacting with the element, we rendered all the rest of the DOM elements inside that uh, button. So you see it's more, more, much more complex. Now the point is that people usually interact with you know 5% of the board, 3% of the board. You don't need to render, re-render uh, all the stuff you know before you uh, interact with that element. So the key here was to uh, render the minimum that required in order to display the board and once the user interacts with a certain element, render the rest of the stuff. So my takeaway is quickly Boot performance, or remember, it's user happiness. Performance is happiness. Users gonna love your tool if it's fast enough. Don't skip the basic optimization stuff, what I went through, but that's not enough. Uh, unless you have to wait for the server, don't wait for the server. Always think when you develop a new feature, if you have to wait for a response from the server. Fetch the data before your users need it. Predict what they need and fetch the data, cache it into the client. And if you can't make it, fake it. Use perceived performance in order to present faster performance. And always remember, boom performance. Thank you.